welcome. Today we're talking about native carnivorous plants. We have John Twomey from the URI Master Gardeners. We have David Schlott from Schlott from the New England uh, Carnivorous Plant Society. Um, so let's give uh, John and David a warm welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. All right. So John and I have been with the NECPS now for what? How many years? Uh, I was 10 years. Yeah, I think I've been since, I think it's, I was at my, the first show mm -hmm. in 03. Um, so yeah, we've been in with this organization for a long time. We've been growing for a long time. I was growing before that, before the internet introduced me to a group of other like-minded crazy people like me. So I've been doing this for a long time because I just thought, hey, this is cool. I like bugs. I like nature. I like to be in the dirt, right? And that's why we garden. You like to be in the dirt. And John, uh, John, he's been building bogs since like uh, it's about five or six years now. For, yeah. yeah. And you helped us build the bog at uh, at you are at the not you are right? at the, uh, the botanical center the, in the Providence, 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 Roger Williams yeah. Park. We started building one there, and uh, we had, ran into some uh, difficulties, so it didn't come out the way we wanted it to. I built one back in my home here in Riverside. A photo of it floating around, um, and we'll make sure that everybody on the internet gets to see the picture of the photo. And then uh, uh, myself and some other people, uh, Gary, who's here in the audience, and a few other people, we we uh, decided that we were going to build a bog for carnivorous plants at the greenhouse at the Rhode Island Veterans Home. So uh, we dug it up, we got it going, and it's thriving, and it's really getting large. Do you have a question? So it, it's it's nature's a, a bog <clears throat> is a homemade swamp. It's the best way I can explain it um, because these plants that we have here today that we're showing you live in the woods in swamps, very moist, a lot of um, peat moss, yep, things like that. So um, now we we re re recreating this. And and it's not difficult to do. It's usually the science of 50-50, 50% peat moss and 50% silica sand, which is nothing more than pool filter sand that you can buy at your local hardware store. So if you have a pool or a sauna, if you're using that sand for the filter, <clears throat> all you have to meet, do 50-50. When you're building on the scale that I'm building, kind of tough to get that 50 50 but i've done it so much that i can by looking at it i can say okay i need a little bit more sand or a little bit more peat moss and it's working because the plants are thriving yeah and to be fair if you're like 52 48 they're not going to get mad at you you have a question okay so the question is 50 50 by volume or by weight uh that's by volume, generally, by right? Volume. Yeah. So uh, you're gonna you want to when you pick it up have equal parts, all right? Um, and you know silica sand is is probably the best option. But if you just can't get that, like I didn't know what I was doing the first time I built a bog, and I didn't use silica sand. I used perlite. People are like, oh, perlite, but it worked. Right, so it, the, the trick is that it's inert, just like peat moss is inert, and silica sand is inert. There's no uh, real pH associated with it; slightly acidic, but not really, um, and it has no nutrients in it. When you get the peat moss, you want to avoid stuff like Miracle Grow that's fortified with, uh, you know, plant food. They do that for seedlings and stuff, but. In nature, these bogs, which are kind of like a subset of swamp, like swamps are, they stink because of all the decaying material, right? But bogs generally have some sort of drainage, even though they remain moist, so that any of that stuff is flushed away. And they, bogs are inert. They have almost no plant food, no nutrients in the surrounding soil, hence carnivory, right? Because they got to get their food somewhere. You know, sunlight's great, but it can't be everything. I got to get my phosphorus. I got to get my nitrogen, whatever. So the bugs wind up being these sort of flying little vitamin pills, right? 
and it's a one a day plants. I'll have a lot more of those during this. Like, I'm just getting warmed up. So, uh, but yeah, so the bog that you built, uh, it's important to note that this is native right here in Rhode Island, right? So anybody here can do it in their backyard. I'm in New York. He's in Rhode Island. There's uh, one at the Black Jungle in, uh, is that, that's not Vermont yet, is it? Or is no, it, I don't think so. The Northern Mass. I think it's the northern border of Massachusetts. They have a bog that's thriving. So you can do it here. Like, oh, but it's cold. Right? Sure, you can. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Right now, you can't see it because what I do, because it's only two years old and the plants are just really starting to come in their own. Um, what I like to do is to cover them up with Christmas trees. So, what happens is when Christmas comes and it goes, People throw their Christmas trees out right away. I was getting Christmas trees Christmas Day, actually. Yeah. And I cut half the branches off of it. And I believe I have eight Christmas trees this year for the bog in uh, the veterans' home. And I use those branches and I lay those over the top of everybody. And then I take the Christmas trees, branches up, and lay them on top of them. And what that does, it it helps when it snows, like we didn't get a lot of snow this year, but the year before when we had that blizzard and we had 22 inches, that was his first winter. <clears throat> the snow will actually lay on top of the Christmas tree. So now when it melts, it melts slowly and drips down into the bog and waters it instead of having heavy snow on these plants and, and freezing them. Um, it's a good insulator, but you need to let the plants get a little bit more mature. Probably another year I'll do this, and then after that I won't need to do that once it really fills in. The bog at my house, I don't put Christmas trees on anymore. It's well established. It's about six, seven years old now, and it's really well established and it's it thrives. And so the point being that if you look up, like, well, hey, where does my Venus flytrap grow in the wild? Where does my Saracenia grow in the wild? You're going to see south of here for the most part, right? You're going to see North Carolina for the Venus flytrap, you're going to see all the way down into the Florida panhandle for Saracenia, right? You will see Saracenia all the way up into Canada, too. So it depends on what kind you get. But all of them can be frost tolerant. They're, they're a lot tougher than people think they are. Like, oh, this one's from Georgia. It's going to die in the frost. No, it's not. It'll be fine, especially once it gets established and has a good root base. They are much sturdier than people think. Uh, and I babied mine for years. Uh, I have a small, like a five by three in ground bog. I babied it the first couple of years, covering it with burlap, doing this, doing that. And in one year, I was just like, I had two little kids. They were driving me crazy. And I'm like, I just can't, I can't. It's going to live or it's going to die, which is pretty much how I grow all my plants. You live how I take care of you or you're out. Uh, but in the next year, to my delight, it came back up and it was probably even better than in the prior years. I have the centerpiece of the bog is Saracenia oreophila, which is from, I want to say Georgia. So it's pretty far south. It doesn't care. On It's New York winters. It's like, yeah, bring it. So uh, I, you know, I feel like, especially once they're older, right? Because, I mean, this guy's like this big around. Um, they're really hardy. Uh, Venus flytraps, I've had freeze solid over the winter, like solid, you know, under ice like this probably wasn't the greatest thing to do, right? But then when it thawed in the spring, the leaves still worked. Okay, so these guys are pretty tough. So that's, you know, and, and that experience with this Venus flytrap is what told me, oh, you know, I want to put a bigger garden in the ground and see how it does. So that's been great. Um, so let's start talking about these plants specifically that grow. Uh, and I think John's going to bring up a Venus flytrap that has a few companions in the pot. Yeah, so, uh, so this plant was growing over at the Rhode Island Veterans Home and uh, inside the greenhouse. As this was last year's plants. It went into a small hibernation. It's, it's come out now. Also mixed in with it is uh, a favorite of carnivorous plant enthusiasts. Uh, is called a Cape Sundew. And if you see and look at it very closely, you can see the hairs on it. And they're really 
sticky and they look like there's dew on them. So what happens is the bugs find them it be very attractive. They think it's water and they land on them and they stick to them. And that's how that plant actually um, feeds itself. So that is a tropical plant. <clears throat> I have to separate these two because the Venus flytrap is not tropical. A lot of people think the Venus flytrap is tropical. It is not. It is native to the Wilmington area of North and South Carolina, right there on the border. So, and they're federally protected down there because everybody was going in and getting them. So, for the Venus flytrap to exist, to thrive, it must go into dormancy, must be cold, has to experience a frost. If it doesn't experience a frost, it will die. This plant this year didn't really get a good frost, but it, the first year of the plant doesn't really need that frost, but this year, this has to go outside. Um, another way to tell if your plants are doing really well or thriving, if you look at the leaves on the Venus flytrap coming up, they're small and, and the trap is kind of large. And I have a trap here that's just getting ready to come up. And the, and the leaf on it is very skinny. So this plant is thriving. Sometimes when they come out of hibernation, they need that sunlight. So you'll see the Venus flytrap in stores, the leaves will be really wide. And then they'll have a small trap. That's just because it doesn't have enough sunlight yet. Once the sunlight starts to go and uh, help grow it, it will actually change. But the traps only last about three or four traps. So it'll trap a bug six to seven days later, it opens up, wind of the nature will sweep that bug away and it will go through the process again. But about the third or fourth time, the plant will start to turn black, the trap. That's okay, because once that trap dies, it sends up some new ones. And if you wanna take it some time after our presentation to come up and look at it, You'll see this one here has got just a bunch of little ones coming up all over the place. So this is gonna be a really good plant this year. Um, they all are, they're, they're, they're thriving. So um, the greenhouse helps, but they'd rather be outside. Yes. So the question is, do I start these plants from seeds and what do they eat? You can start there from seeds. It is a very time consuming process because you have to um, put them through stratification, which means they have to be cold. So some people put, it, put them on a napkin, put them in a refrigerator for 30 days, a damp napkin or something like that. Some people just throw them outside. Hopefully they'll grow. It, it depends on what you want to do. Um, when they flower, if you have several of them, that one flower, when the flowers come up on the rest of them, cut them back because the flower is actually takes a lot of energy out of the plant. So what you want to do is save your, save your energy for the plant. But if you want some seeds, just let one, one of them flower and get those seeds and then try that. You can buy seeds online if you don't want to go through that process. It's really not that big. And I'm, I'm sure that through the New England Carnivorous Plant Society, they have meetings and they do a lot at Briggs Greenhouse, I believe is the name of it in Attleboro. And I'm sure that you can get seeds if you go to that. Uh, if you look that up and find out when their next meeting is, um, I think it's usually by the third Saturday. Yeah, I think so. Third Saturday of the month. Um, I know that someone will have seeds. And if, and you, if you wanted to, you could contact them and they'll, they'll make sure they have seeds with them. And they're not that expensive, but it's a little bit of a process. You can buy the plants. Um, it depends on where you go. If you buy them through like a New England Carnivorous Plant Society, you're going to get, you know, a plant like this for maybe $7. You go to um, Jordan's Jungle in Pawtucket, Providence Line, that's a $20 plant. Hmm. So they're very expensive. Yeah, and, and to the point of the seeds, there's other methods of propagation besides seeds once you have the plant. Uh, and we've both done both right, or all three. So various carnivorous plants, I mean, Venus flytraps, like John said, they make seeds, but they don't make a ton, right? They, they make, you know, each flower makes eh, five or six seeds and you might get five flowers on a plant. Two of them don't set seeds. So, you know, you get, you wanna be very careful and go through that process. 
On the other hand, when Saracenia bloom and they make seeds, you get hundreds of seeds from a flower. It's just like raining seeds. So it's like, eh, throw it in a pot, throw it outside, see what happens. Because you, what am I going to do with 300 Saracenia seedlings, right? Like they're going to kick me out of my house. So if I get, you know, 10% to, to grow, well, that's fine. But then I'm not growing them to sell them, right? So I'm growing them just for fun. You know, oh, I got these seeds. Let's see what happens. Um, and it's, you know, for the way I do it, like I said before, you live or you die. It's kind of like my Darwinian approach to, you know, these seeds sprouted. Okay, well, you have an opportunity uh, based on the way I care for my plants. But I'm really, like I meant, I keep saying this, I'm very cavalier about my plant care. Uh, it's laissez-faire for me. So the bomb-proof plants are great. Uh, and then, so, but when it gets to the propagation, again, bomb-proof, the bomb-proof method of propagating this plant, uh, and I'm going to use a Saracenia here because it's a little bigger. But you can see here, this is a young one. So it's got all the leaves, I don't know if the camera can see, all the leaves coming out of one growth point, all right? Each growth point, when they mature, will send up a flower stalk. Each growth point is represented of the root structure of this plant. This is a rhizome plant, and actually Venus flytraps are too. But that, and you guys as gardeners know what the rhizome structure is. But as these growth points start to form, these things are amazingly resilient to being broken apart. So every growth point represents a potential division. Now, I like my plants to have a lot of traps on them and be big and robust. So when I divide them, I just take a few off the edge, right? Just because what happens actually, if I leave it in this pot next year, the sides will be bulging out. I'll either have to repot it, which I mean, this is a skinny pot, so that's what I would do. But in the larger pots, I'm like, I don't have a bigger pot. So I have to bring out this whole big old root ball and peel off divisions from the side and then, you know, pot up those divisions and then give them to people who are like, what the hell do I do with this? So, um, but yeah, so divisions is great. And Venus flytraps, um, I bought them like this one I bought last year because it was a different variety that I didn't have. But I've grown them from seeds from my own flowers. But I've divided, I get most of mine from dividing my plants. Um, you'll get one, it'll sit in the ground, like, oh, that's a nice looking plant. And then I have to change the dirt in this pot. The dirt's getting old. I go, I pull it up and it falls apart. And instead of one plant, I've got seven. I'm like, oh, okay. So they really divide readily from the roots. So you can do the vegetative propagation that way, um, or you can do seeds. And Venus flytraps can be done. I've never done it successfully, but I haven't tried that hard. I have to caveat. Um, they can be done from leaf cuttings too. I haven't tried that. Yeah, I, I, it was all the rage on the internet. Like, you know, I don't know. I'm not gonna say how many years ago, it's embarrassing, but it was all the rage on the internet. Peel off the plant, do this, do that. And like, people are like, oh, I had great success. And I'm like, I tried it twice and it didn't work. I was like, forget that. I'm just gonna divide them. But it can be done if you have the knack for it um, or the equipment. So your question number two was, what do they eat? So what I tell everybody is, do not get into carnivorous plants for pest control. It's not <laughs> pest control. They will eat mosquitoes. They will eat crickets. Green fly traps will eat crickets, flies, yellow jackets. Not so much ticks because on a Venus fly trap, you're not going to be able to see it on television, and actually none of you are going to really see it unless you really get up close, but we're going to show you a picture of it. There are six hairs, three on each side. They have to be triggered. Two of them have to be triggered, either one on each side simultaneously or two on the same side. That's what triggers the plant. So when you see little kids come up to the Venus flytrap and stick their finger in it, well, yeah, it's going to close, but now the plant is not is looking for food and it's not going to get any food. So that's a lot of energy for that trap to close and then eventually reopen. And it's not getting any nutrients. The other thing about um, the different size bugs is the different size traps. These traps here are kind of small, so it's going to be small bugs. But you get into some of the big, well-established, um, what they call B-52, huge. I've seen little frogs in them. And um, they go for big crickets. And you can feed them. 
one thing you don't feed a Venus flytrap is hamburger or hot dogs. Not without ketchup. <laughs> because it will kill them. Yeah. The, the, the fat inside the, that meat will kill them. So a lot of people, when I was growing up, you get a Venus flytrap and you fed it raw hamburger and it would die. And you'd be like, oh, my plant died. Well, that's why it died. You can't feed it that. Now, if you want to go out and catch, and this is sounds cruel, if you put your plant outside right now, it will feed itself. You don't have to do anything. It will feed itself. But if you really want to get it a jump start on it, if you catch a fly, take a wing off of it so it doesn't fly out of your hand, you could put the fly inside the trap. You could feed it with a pair of tweezers. The trap will close on it, and you will fed your plant. Yep. And your other option, if fly surgery is not your uh, cup of tea, is put the fly in the freezer for 30 seconds. It will go to sleep. It will not die in 30 seconds, but it will get, it'll, it'll get stunned, right? And then, so then you can just drop it in the leaf. And as it wakes up and starts to stir, that also works. The question is, does it need to be alive? Yes. No, that's going to have the same problem as the hamburger meat. So remember, John mentioned the trigger hairs, which makes the track close when you touch it twice, because it has to be touched twice or even more, depending on the, how sensitive the plant is, because it doesn't want to close on dust or a twig that accidentally gets blown in by the breeze, because it can only close a finite number of times, right? You know, it can, it can close and open without digesting more times than with, but then it's not getting anything, no bang for the buck in that case. So if it closes accidentally on something that's not food, a twig, a blade of grass, whatever, that's not struggling in the trap. So the repeated touches of the trigger hair, once it's closed, is what actually stimulates the digestive process. It gets the leaf to close, to seal, and then to start secreting the enzymes to drown and digest the, the prey. And it will get tighter. So if there's nothing wiggling in there, the plant will close, but it'll just be like, you can see the fly inside it. But the fly is moving, or whatever the little creature might be, it will it'll, it'll shut really super tight. Now, when we do our shows, we have in the past gone to your favorite pet store and got some frozen crickets or something like that, freeze dried crickets. and. Just, just so we could show everybody the whole process of it. But that is not the way you should be feeding your plants. But honestly, if you have a Venus flight trap, you do not have to feed it. It will feed itself. Yeah. The question is, where does the waste go, right? So um, these plants, the Venus flight traps in particular, um, just let the wind and the rain wash away the body of the unfortunate victim when they reopen. Plants like this don't. They, I mean, this is a brand new one, so it won't be there, but at the end of the season, it will be, I'll hold this up so the camera can see. At the end of the season, this doesn't have a way to get rid of waste. So you'll just have compacted bug exoskeletons coming up and, and for more successful traps, they'll actually get so full that the weight makes them flop over. In, yep, yep, there's nowhere to, nothing to do with them. They can't digest them. So this plant here, okay, what happens with this plant here, and I, I meant to bring some in from my bog so I could show everybody, and I was in a hurry because I did not want to be late. So I didn't bring any dead ones in. This plant will fill up. But once it gets full enough, you'll start to see it turn color. It'll mm -hmm. turn black. Once that turns black, that that particular leaf is now what we call dead. So it's just no longer functioning. But every time one of these dies, it will shoot up two more in its place. Yeah. That's why these plants thrive and grow so fast and get so big and so full so quickly because they just, the, the bog at the veterans home, Gary will test, testify to this. The, the plants are huge now and they were only put in, uh, it'd be two years this May. And they were tiny, tiny little plants. You've seen the pictures of them very tiny plants. So it doesn't take long. And if anybody from the area wants to come by the veterans homes on the weekends, I'm usually there. I'd be happy to show you what the insides look like. Um, but they'll fill up with bugs. 
And the fun thing about this plant is, now, this is young. Now, some of the plants we have at the Veterans Home are about this tall. And the traps, the tops of them are huge. And if you're quiet and you sit there and you watch when the sun is just right, like at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on a nice summer night, you can see the plant vibrating. And you can hear it going. Rrr, rrr, rrr. That's the bug inside getting stuck. There may be two or three of them in there mm -hmm. on top of everybody else. Yeah. And they're trying to get out, but they can't. And it just buzzes. And you can see it vibrating and buzzing. And it's fun to sit there and watch bees, yellow jackets. Love the yellow jackets. They, they get to the top of it and they go, oh, what's inside? And they climb down. Once they climb down inside, they can't get out. And we have a party when that happens because we hate the yellow jackets. Yes, yeah, that's for sure. But this is a very fun plant to, to have around and watch. Uh, and it's unique. Like this one here is mature. This one is just coming into its maturity. And this baby. is a little baby coming up. And there's a couple more babies coming up. So this is a, a, a pretty good uh, start for this plant here. Yep. This is a division from an adult plant um, that I had at home, which I, the, the pot, like I said earlier, was ballooning out. So I just took a couple pieces off. You have a question? So the question is, once they die and they turn black, do we have to groom it? No. And the reason we don't groom it, or I don't groom it, is there's nobody in the wild doing it. So right. these plants, we're trying to replicate the wild of these plants. So there's nobody out there dividing them. We divide them so we can share them with other people so they can have the, the love of what we have of these plants. But in reality, there's nobody out there in the wild looking for these plants and grooming them and cutting them back and taking care of the dead ones. No, no. Yep. Yeah. Well, it probably doesn't look good right now because it's still March. It's not, it's going to, I mean, if you feel comfortable taking some of the dead stuff off the bottom, um, I'm probably going to do that to some of my plants because mine are like eight or nine years old now. So I'm going to do it not so much to, to clean it up as, so I can see where I have to split it. And that's the point. It's more of a presentation thing. Like cutting off dead parts of a leaf aren't going to hurt the plant, right? But cutting off the entire, like if the top half is, like if the bottom half is, is dead, but the top half is still green, it's still photosynthesizing for the plant, even if it can't digest. It's still going to do some photosynthesis. So I generally don't remove mine until they're completely dead. Or I'm about to go to a presentation and I want them to look nice. Uh, and in which case I have a conversation with them. I go, listen, I know you're going to miss out on a little photosynthesis here, but my plants are divas. So they're like, yeah, take it. I got to look my best. So, you know, they're, I mean, they are so full of themselves. <laughs> go ahead. Ah, the great question. So they photosynthesize, but they also eat insects. Evolutionarily speaking, why would that happen? Well, remember where we said they grow at the beginning of the presentation. They grow in bogs. Well, ours do. They grow in bogs with inert soil. There's no nutrition in the soil. Now, anyone who grows vegetables knows that it, you have to fertilize your plants to get a good yield, right? So they, they photosynthesize also but they get nutrition through their roots for other things that the plant needs. You know, you need more than just sunlight to grow. So they don't have that. And there's nobody out in the wild going, oh, this bog needs miracle grow. That they, you know, we, don't, we don't have, and even if you did actually, evolutionarily speaking, that would kill them. Yep. Uh, and carnivory, interestingly, has, developed, has evolved independently, uh, convergent evolution in how many genuses? Nine now? Ten? Yeah. Nine or ten genus of plants. Um, and, you know, the, there's a pitcher plant in Australia called uh, Cephalotus. There's, a pitch, there's pitcher plants in Southeast Asia that look like this. That also that grow in, with similar uh, constraints on, on nutrition. Um, there's different 
uh, genus within the Saracenaceae family. I think I'm saying that right. My Latin's terrible. Um, but Saracenia is one genus in the Saracenaceae family, which also includes Heliumphora and Darlingtonia. Darlingtonia is from California, and Heliumphora is from uh, the steppes of South America. So, and then Venus flytraps are actually, I think they're most closely related to sundews, if I remember. I'm right. not really quite sure. I'm not sure. But then you also have Drosera, which grow the sticky traps, right? And then you've also got another plant, uh, Dros Drosophyllum or Drosophyllum. I don't know if I'm putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable or not. But the, the, the Drosophyllum grows, it's the Portuguese dewy pine. It grows in Portugal in like really bizarre conditions. Um, like the wind swept, slightly alkaline, vaguely desert seaside cliffs, which is, I don't even know what you'd call that. But th that grows over there. And that has the exact same trapping mechanism as the Drosera, yet they developed independently. So, but they're all responding to the same uh, niche pressure of overtaking and being able to grow in a niche environment where, where their roots go. There's nothing to eat. Some of our uh, plants we have over here that they've brought these, um, these are called Nepenthes. And there are a boatload of different type of Nepenthes. And as you can see, some of these pictures, very colorful. This is a brand new one coming in. It hasn't even opened up yet. Neither has this one. These are open. Now, the funny thing about a Nepenthes, when the top part of this goes underneath the plant, it will shoot up a new plant automatically. And if you let these mature long enough and get big enough, the picture on the top will be completely different than the picture on the bottom. Same plant, two different pictures. Question. Do you have this in a pot hanging and they're coming down? Yes. In the wild, nature. This is an excellent question. So the question is, I have these in a pot and they're hanging, right? So how does it grow in the wild? So Nepenthes are vines, okay? So they grow, um, some of them grow in the ground and will grow up through the brush like a vine. And some of them are vines, but they're really short vines and they really grow like shrubs. Um, we grow them hanging because uh, it allows you to see the pictures better. Um, but some of them are actually epiphytes and some of them are lithophytes. There's one species that's a lithophyte. Um, so they'll grow in like the crotch of a tree in a collection of moss or they'll grow on the side of a cliff. That's the lithophyte. Um, and, you know, so they really, they, Nepenthes as a vine has conquered many nutrient deficient niches in Southeast Asia. Now there's one from, I, oh, we got a, we got a hand raised in the back. So the question is, is there any uh, carnivorous plants that do well inside the house, like a, a, a bog in a bowl? Very good question, because I used to give that class with the New England carnivorous plants. Uh, I used to do build a bog session. I used to do it every spring. And we build a bog, small little um, pots, has a little cork that goes underneath it, a little plastic cork. You know, take it out. Do the 50-50 mix. We used to put in a uh, Saracenia, a Venus flytrap, and we would probably try to do a um, North American sundew, and <clears throat> which we have one of them up here. I got some young ones. Yeah, here. Th these are North American. These grow alongside Venus flytraps and Saracenia in the wild. And it is early, early spring, so they're small, but they will get about yay high uh, and completely fill the pot. You see these so little... that would be what you would be looking for as your indoor pot. Uh, however, those plants actually belong outside. So you would put that outside and leave it out there, and let it thrive. The Nepenthes are basically tropical to most standards. They will not go outside and do well, they'll die. Um, even though some are highlands where they come off of cliffs, but these, are, these make nice house plants. I have some in my house. They stay in my house. Or I will transfer them over to the greenhouse for the winter 
and then bring them back for the summer. Maybe put them out in my backyard underneath a tree um, and let them thrive. But they do well in the house yeah, in the winter time. Just a comment. Uh, I know those plants look interesting. If you see them in the bog, they are absolutely stunning. The color, the height. <laughs> so the comment is that uh, you know, the ones that we have up here look interesting, but the ones that are like in full growth in the bog are very large, colorful, and, and incredible, um, which is true. I mean, we are dealing with, I mean, it's, this is just you know, mid-March, right? So even though, even in the greenhouse, these guys are just barely waking up, right? And the ones that I have outside are still completely out. Um, you know, outside, the only thing that's coming up now are snowdrops and crocuses, um, and it's been a mild winter. But in the greenhouse, these guys, you know, they get the sun a little earlier, so they're like, oh, it's warm. Maybe I can wake up a little early. But um, these are not five-year-old kids that get up at four in the morning. That's, that's not them. They, they get up, they wait till it's nice and warm out, and the ones that are outside, they're not going to start growing, like actually putting up growth until – May. Late, late April, early May at the, er, the earliest, right? So they, they're later recoverers from winter. Um, but, you know, so if we were doing this lecture in mid-June, it would be like, you know, oh, here comes my plant. But, These people would be thriving. Yeah. Um, so they, they really start, they, they have to grow fast because they're perennials. So if you notice, most of our perennials, they do rapid growth during the growing season. And then our tropicals kind of just do what they do because they're not under the pressure of going dormant. So, um, but yeah, they, they really are spectacular once they're grown in. I have, I have the Oreophila I mentioned as the centerpiece. It gets this tall and it's this big around. You know, those, those circle things that you put the stake up plants, I have to put four to contain it. It's ridiculous. And I mean, that plant is 20 years old, maybe. And I got it as a division smaller than this about 20 years ago. It doesn't take long for them to grow. And I've divided, I've cut it in half like four times since then. And it's still like this. So they grow relatively rapidly. Uh, they really expand their root size. Um, and, and, you know, if you give them room, they will take it up. And that's another thing. Can I grow it in a pot like this forever? Yeah, I can, but I don't want to. I want to let it have a little bit more room because more room means more growth points. More growth points means more leaves. More leaves means, oh, that's a monster plant. And after all, I mean, we're just in love with monster plants. Mm. I mean, that's just what it is. But they are, the only reason that my wife lets me grow them is because they're spectacularly beautiful. Otherwise, they'd be out. Yes. Correct. So the question is, can you start a bog in your yard because of the droughts that we've been going through in like a, a kiddie pool? So yes, you can. I would suggest if you do that, you poke a few holes in the bottom of your kiddie pool because you don't want the water to just sit there and go stagnant because it will start to stink. Now, when I, Gary and I built the bog at the veterans home, we lined the whole thing with a rubber uh, liner that we use for um, pools, um, for like fish pools, and but we poked holes in them. And it was actually two pieces, so they, they, they were overlapped. So it wasn't gonna hold the water like, like a pool would. So it keeps the water from draining out immediately, one, so it does stay moist, and two, it helps prevent the dirt, the earth from mixing in with my media that I've produced. Because now with the Christmas tree is going on it, I'm getting the pine leaves in there, the pine needles are going in there, making it a little bit more acidy, giving it a little bit of this. I also get um, uh, long sphagnum moss. You know, it, it, is, it, is it hard to grow? Not really. Just take that block of sphagnum moss, throw it in a five gallon bucket, let it sit overnight, 
let it get really wet, wear gloves, and spread it on the top of your bog. By the end of the year, it'll be all green. It'll look like like something out of out of uh, the bog or the the shows that you see in, in Alaska where they have all this moss growing on trees and stuff like that. That's what your bog will look like. And that helps keep the moisture in and helps when the seeds fall, the seeds will fall into that and that will help the growth on that too. And it's interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, one second. It's interesting. There's uh, a, a natural allegory for the way he poked holes in the d double layers in, in nature that's called a seepage bog. So they actually have those you know, in nature. And I don't, I mean, nature has the soil separate from other soil just by virtue of geography, right? But they do drain just much more slowly than most other areas, right? So again, if they didn't drain, they would eventually not be nutrient poor anymore just from leaves flying in and rotting and stuff. But that stuff slowly seeps out. And since they don't get a ton of detrius coming in, it keeps them uh, inert. And, and you had a question. Yes, what kind of water? Ah, so the ultimate question, what kind of water do I give them? Um, a, a lot of people get mad at me when I say I just need my hose. But I have a well, all right? So I am in a unique circumstance where I am not on city water. City water has fluoride and chlorine and God knows what else, right? Who knows what's in your city water? So. It's better to use tap water than to let them die of thirst. But if you have to use your city water to water them, make sure you flush them when you get an opportunity with rainwater or purified water. If you, if you have a, for example, if you're growing, most of us grow these in dishes, right? Because they like the boggy soil. So you have in a pot, you have in a dish. And then you watch the water go down. When the dish has been dry a day or two, then you water it again. Well, if I'm doing that with tap water, that's slowly going to uh, make all that tap water um, contamination sit in my soil. So what I'll do is, oh, I've used tap water a couple of times. I'm going to put you out in the rain, right? And then I'm not going to put the dish. I'm going to put you out in the rain without the dish so the rain can flush the soil. And that way, you can use any water, but you have to be aware that you don't want to let contamination build up in the soil. The statement is she'll fill a pot with tap water and leave it for a while and let the chlorine evaporate. And that does work for chlorine, but I, you know, depends on what else is in your water. So that's not gonna work on every chemical. Could you make your own distilled water? Yes, you could if you had something to distill it with. That's an awful lot of effort when you can go buy it for $1.69 or wait for it to rain, right? So, um, you know, I grow my stuff outdoors, so it, rains it rains on them whenever it rains but if it, if we have a month-long drought i'm out there with the hose because again better to get them bad water than no water now for anybody watching online or here in the audience today if you're from this area and i say providence anybody who is on the situate reservoir water supply Crystal, Barrington, Warren, East Providence, Providence, the water is fine. It will not harm your plants. I use it all the time. I've used it for years. In fact, we hook up a hose at the veteran's home and turn the water on, and I water my bog from the bottom. I actually have soaker hoses going through the whole entire bog, about six or seven inches down. And then we planted the plants, put more stuff on top, so they're buried. So I water from the bottom. And what I do is we just hook up the hose, we turn the water on, we go about doing what we're doing during the course of the morning. And when I notice puddles on the top, we turn, turn the off. water off and it's completely watered thoroughly. And it will last that way for a good three or four or five days. And then if we get some rain, even better. So there's no such thing as overwatering them. But if you do use something home, like a home pot, they're very small, you can get them bigger sizes. Um, there's a hole in the bottom of them. Like I was saying earlier, you get the little, so a little plastic cork type thing that goes inside. 
if you're using tap water, maybe so often, put it outside, pull the plug, let it rain on it, you'll be fine. You have a flush right out. Because you, if, you, if you take a plant, um, we, we put them off to the side. You've got this sitting in a dish. Oh, I got one. Okay, and the dish is sitting there, and you water this plant with house water, uh, tap water, sitting here like this. It's in tap water, and this dries out. You'll notice white. That's the salt and all the minerals that was in the water. Now that the water's evaporated, all those minerals and everything are in here. So that means it's time to flush. You want to get a good flush. So, and clean your tray. Yes. And, and this is how um, the DYI I am. This is, this is not a plant tray. This is the front of a floodlight that died. I said, I need a tray. Here we go. <laughs> but it works. So, I mean, that's just a couple of little tricks that we have uh, for them. There's one plant that I really wanted to talk about. It, it, it's, uh, you mentioned the name of it. It's from California. and Darlingtonia. Uh, yes. Also known as a cobra lily. One of the most sought after uh, plants. So cool. In, in the um, realm of us who grow carnivorous plants. The problem with it is extremely, extremely difficult to grow. Um, it's very... Uh, hard to grow. Um, there's two versions. There's a highland and a lowland. I know from stories I've heard, people have tried to uh, go out to the West Coast. You'll find them in the Northern California, uh, Southern Oregon area. And they'll actually, they'll actually pick them and, and, and dig them up and they die because they, they just don't like that. It's a beautiful plant. It's fun to watch and try to grow, <clears throat> but it is frustrating because you just, you just don't like to be in captivity. We had a contest. Yeah. Remember at the NACPS, we did a contest. Not so much a contest, an experiment. Um, because even if you killed it, you were supposed to bring in your plant and say what happened. So at the beginning of the season, everyone got a Darlingtonia. It was like in February or March, everyone got one uh, who wanted to participate. And the stipulation was you get this plant. Um, and then I can't remember if we did it over a year or a year and a half, uh, whatever, for whatever the time period we grew this plant, we took notes on how we cared for the plant. And then everyone brought their plant into the show. And the plant that did the best was the plant where this guy set it up with a refrigerator cooler on one of those fountains, you know, those little fountains you can get in like uh, Target or whatever that the, the cycles the water constantly. So he got a version of that, like a water pump that he placed. He basically made a, a constantly flowing river that was chilled with a refrigerator cooler. Are you kidding? That's a lot of work, but that's how they grow in nature. They're water cold the snow melt from the Rockies. Cold water from the Rockies, exactly. What, what happens is, you know, people try to put ice cubes on them. But if that, that was my trick. If, if that water gets too warm, or that root system gets too warm, the plant will just die. Yeah. It, it stresses right out. So it, it's tough to keep that plant, uh, especially here, keep it cold. I mean, you're constantly having to put ice water in it. I, I, used, I put ice cubes on it every day on my way to work. Now I don't go to work, so I can't have them. I work from home, so I can't have it. And I'm not going to work. Where am I going to put my ice cubes? But uh, I, mean, I kept it alive for a season. And, and actually the next year I kept it alive, but then I went away on vacation and there was a heat spell. I got back and it was dead because I wasn't there to put ice cubes on it. And like my neighbor was taking care of my plants, isn't going to be putting ice cubes on this one. So I learned my lesson. If I'm going to have to grow one of those things, I can't go on vacation or I have to build an entire fountain for one plant. Uh, you know, we have some that are very tough. There's another one, I believe it's from the Malaysia area. <clears throat> I had one. It, it wasn't hard to grow. Uh, I can't think of the scientific name of it off the top of my head. I'm not very good with the Latin names. That was the only plant that I could say in Latin very well because I had it. <laughs> and But it's called the fang plant. And the pitcher really in the wild and mature will get like yay big. It's huge. It actually sits on the ground. 
and it has two fangs that come down off the lid of the trap. That's by Calcarada. Yes, thank you. I got it. Um, what will happen is it secretes a juice or a fluid from those two fangs. Because it sits on the ground, the ants climb it and go onto the pitcher and try to get the dew that's coming off of the, the fangs and falls into the pitcher. And that's how that plant feeds. Yeah, and that one is extremely difficult because it is a true tropical lowland, meaning 90 degrees, dripping humidity. And at night, it really can't get colder than like 70. So, you know, that's fine and dandy during the summer in New York. That's how it is. Then comes winter and the plant is six feet across, right? Now I heat my greenhouse, but I'm not heating my greenhouse to 90. No, thank you. My electrical bill will be out the roof. I can't keep it inside at six feet across and I'm not heating the house to 90. So it's, it's hard. So unless you have a dedicated hot house or hot, um, hot room, it's really difficult to keep that plant. It is rewarding because it makes monster pictures. I grew mine inside of uh, a fish tank. Problem with that is nobody got to see it. We're sitting in a room in my house all by itself in a fish tank. It was so lonely. It looked beautiful. And I only got it, it was only that big. When I, when it, actually, when they just finally like, had to let it go, it was, it had huge pictures on it. So, I mean, you have to be dedicated to some of these plants, um, you know, if you're really into the Nepenthes and some of these other plants. I think today's uh, talk is mostly about our native plants around here, that th which these are easy to grow. These are something that you can, it's, it's like almost like a tulip. You know, you put it in the ground and you let it go and you enjoy it and then it'll come back next year. This, as long as you keep it moist, whether you leave it in a pot, in a bog, wherever you put it, what does it matter? As long as you keep it moist and, and, and keep it in the sunlight, it'll thrive. Because these plants love sunlight. That's a good point. Uh, he mentions, just leave it alone. They thrive on neglect, which is perfect for me because you know I'm constantly forgetting to do stuff. So you get it set up in the bog situation so that it doesn't dry out or in a pot with the tray so it doesn't dry out in like half a day. And then if you forget to do anything for a couple of days because you're a space cadet like me, no big deal. It's like, hey, what's up when you get over, when you get over there? So he's like, yeah, I've been just eating, chilling here on the, de on the deck, you know, what you got for me, you know? So, uh, you know, these guys uh, are a little bit more troublesome, but even with those, you can find ones that are less maintenance yeah. and, ones that are more maintenance. So the trick is when you're getting into the hobby, start with our local. Start with our Saracenia, start with our Venus flytraps. Our Drosera tracy, uh, sorry, Drosera feriformis, Var tracei or Var filiformis. Um, that's our local sundew. These actually used to grow, the, the uh, filiformis, they used to grow in the green swamp here in Rhode Island. Uh, Saracenia purpurea grows all through Rhode Island, Vermont, upstate New York, downstate New York, Connecticut. That Saracenia purpurea, you could find here. Uh, in fact, it grows in the, in the great, great swamp. In the great swamp. There's like 14 different carnivorous plant species that grow in great swamp. Um, and, and there you'll have the whole idea of a bog slash swamp. That it's a swamp. If you're going to go down there, make sure you wear some good sized boots, um, especially now. I wouldn't go now because they're not, you won't find them because they're not coming up yet. But once they come up and things start to go, uh, take a, take some time and go down on the bog, down to the sw Great Swamp and take a look at what's growing down there in, in nature. Um, try not to pick any of them. Uh, they, leave, they don't like that. Leave nothing but footprints, really, is, is, the, is the, uh, the message there. I had the good fortune of seeing Venus flytraps growing in the wild. Um, I went down to North Carolina on vacation. I have a friend down there, and I was like, you, you know, hey, do you know any spot you can take me to see some pitcher plants because that's all I knew was growing where I was on vacation. I was in the Outer Bank. And he was like, yeah, the Croatan or Croatan, I'm not sure how you say it, National Park. He's like, yeah, there's a couple sites in there I could take you to. 
So we, we go in there and we're looking around, like we find a couple of uh, pitcher plants. We found some really beautiful ones. And then he goes, oh my God, like this. He's, I'm stepping on Venus flytrap. We found two fields full of Venus flytrap. And I was excited for seeing them for the first time in the wild. And he was over the moon because he was like, I didn't know they come this far north. So uh, I mean, we found what was called complete, two completely unknown populations of Venus flytraps in the wild, in the underbrush. And I almost lost my toes because it almost ate my toes. We were talking about the, uh, the uh, growth of these plants and how you can separate them. So here we have an established plant. And it's coming up. It's, we, we, this is going to be another nice plant. But if you look really close at the side over here, um, you'll see some very small leaves, very, very, very tiny. That's another Venus flytrap cluster getting ready to come up. And then we have a sundew that got mixed in. So when you when you have your plants together inside a greenhouse, make sure you keep the ones that are seeding off to one side and keep the other ones that because I have to tear this all apart. It's not a big deal, but I have to take this out of there because this these can go outside in a couple of weeks and they'll do fine. But this needs to stay outside for next year. This tropical sundew cannot; it will die. So I have to take it out and and that little tiny sundew, if you can see it. And when we're done, if you want to come up and look at them, it will get the size of this pot, about yay high, it'll, it'll completely. So that's how big it will get. So it's, um, and that one gives off a lot of seeds too. Most sundews give off ridiculous amounts of seeds, which is why they start to hijack their way into other plants. This is a scape from a single, uh, one single uh, scape. And there's three, six, uh, there's 11 flower buds, dead, uh, spent flower buds on it. Each individual flower bud can have a hundred seeds. Yeah, this is from a sundew. Now, that's, this is the one kind, the kind that you have is probably cape, right? That was yeah, cape, cape sundew. Cape sundew, yeah. So it does the same thing. It does the same thing, right? And a lot of, sometimes they have more flowers, sometimes they have fewer flowers, but generally speaking, they got a lot of flowers on a, on a scape and they make just a stupid amount of seeds. Like, it's, it's almost like, what do you, it looks like, if you go like this, when, it, when it's first, oh, there's one there. Um, it, it looks like you shook a pepper shaker on your hand. It's so many seeds. And so if you go like this into your bog, you're going to have just a bazillion seedlings. So it's nice. Like, oh, wow, look at all these plants I grew. Like, now what? So that's when you start sharing them with your friends yeah. and you don't tell them what they are so that your friends are, next year, they're like, what did you give me? It spread like fire. And you don't even have to do the plants themselves because look at all the seeds he has here. He's probably got on this particular bowl right here, looking at this, I would say there's more than a thousand seeds. Oh, I could Johnny Appleseed the Great Swamp with that sucker. More than a thousand seeds. So you don't have to ask for the plant. Just ask for the stem. You know, now you got your seeds, all the seeds that you can deal with. I don't know if there's any seeds left in those. Those are there. Those are there. But if anyone wants to escape. Any questions? So, the, so the, the question is, if they want to see a bog, can you go to the Rhode Island Veterans Home to see a bog or go to the um, uh, Roger Williams Zoo Botanical Center? So first part of your question, yes, you can come to the Rhode Island Veterans Home. I would wait a little bit, you know, into April. Once we get everything going in the right direction, everybody starts to come out of their uh, dormancy. The Botanical Center bog was built inside. It does not do very well. I haven't seen it in years. But the problem is that the plants in that do not get dormancy because it's always hot in there. So the Venus flytrap all died. All of the sundews all died. Everything died. It was just too hot. They might have some Nepenthes still growing in there. I don't know. We did try to do an outside bog. We had some resistance. Big story I don't want to get into, but it didn't, it didn't happen there, but it happened at the veterans home. If anybody wants to see the bog, please stop by this summer. It should be in full bloom by 
June 1st. Oh, yeah. With flowers and everything. So oh, colors. It'll, it'll be just... That's correct. So if anybody's familiar with the Rhode Island Veterans Home, it's a brand new facility. It's on Medicom Avenue. And when you go down the main drive to the main building, you're going to come to a stop sign. At that stop sign, you have no choice but to either go straight or we have to go right because there's a one way all around the complex. Once you go around the complex and you get to the back of the complex, you should not have any problems finding the greenhouse because there's a giant 60 foot long, 24 feet wide, 15 feet tall, glass polycarbonate greenhouse. So, and the bog is right there in the front. As you walk up to the front door, we have a perennial on the left and we have the bog on the right. And everybody who comes to visit us, that's the first thing that happens is they stop dead in their tracks and look at it and go, oh my God, what is this? That's correct. They're outdoors. And the blooms that you'll get from the Saracenia are spectacular. Uh, depend, you know, uh, bigger Saracenia grow bigger flowers, but they come in every shade from the color of moonlight. And in a full moon, they glow all the way to like these deep burgundies. And the petals are like velvet. They are gorgeous. We have and a photograph of that around here floating around. Yeah, and you'll see, you'll notice on them, the heads sort of nod over and the petals droop. They're almost like an upside down uh, uh, lily or so. I mean, they're, they're just- Yeah, they look beautiful. like a lily and, and they're upside down, yes. And the pods inside where the seeds are, when they break, they fall, but the petals in the whole, but once that happens, if you so happen to have a Saracenia at home, and you go get to have this spectacular uh, show of, of this plant giving you the flower. Once that flower goes through its process and drops its seeds, or you collect the seeds, cut the stem off, get rid of it. Because all it's doing now is just drawing energy from the plant. Oh, welcome. Yeah. So the question is for the one that where the bodies collect at the bottom, how does it digest the insects? And the, the mechanism is actually very similar uh, in most of these plants. Uh, th this one too has the same um, issue where bodies will collect at the bottom. Oh, look at that nectar. I'm sorry, I got distracted. Squirrel. Um, so the, they digest their prey and, and Venus flytrap and sundews by secreting enzymes within, from inside, they have glands inside the secrete enzyme. And they also, just like us, you know how you like, you know, everyone's talking about probiotics and good, good gut bacteria. Well, they need their good gut bacteria too. So they have gut bacteria. I can't believe I'm saying a plant has gut bacteria. And they secrete enzymes. It works very similarly to our digestion, right? Uh, different chemicals. Um, but, and it's not nearly as acidic as like our stomach acid is like something else, but these are these are like a mild acid. Not like you're going to put your finger in and be like, ah, it's not going to happen. Um, but they do break down the insects and they do secrete. They, they secrete. Interestingly, they secrete a chemical. Some of them do that will that's a wetting agent that will coat the wings of an insect. Um, and the wetting agent will also for some some plants like these guys get reservoirs of liquid at the bottom and the wetting agent will help the insect sink and submerge. Um, they generally drown before the enzymes have a chance to kill them. It's, it's a drowning death. They're not, it's not like a, you're dropping in a pool of acid. I mean, you are, but it's a very mild pool of acid. Um, so that's how they digest. And even sundews. Now, sundews, I like, to, I like to joke when I do show, when I talk about this at the NECPS, you can see they're sticky and the bugs just stick to them. Same thing. They don't have gut bacteria. They don't really have a gut, but they secrete chemicals to help them digest the meal right there on the leaf. Everyone, it's like having a cellophane stomach. Everyone can see what you had for dinner last night. All right. Now, one of the great things that, uh, especially for Venus flytraps, is when they catch certain prey, it makes a great photo op. Like they catch daddy long legs. Now, daddy long legs, the little body fits in the trap, no problem, but the legs don't. So it seals like this, and you've got a bunch of legs sticking out of the leaf like this. Sometimes they're still twitching 
which is just so grim, it's awesome. <laughs> the enzymes in this plant and most of Penthes, so these pitchers, again, if you had to feed it, just drop a fly in it, uh, a cricket. Um, so basically almost, this has got about that much fluid in it. From here down is all fluid. And it's an enzyme, and it's got almost like a narcotic type. Oh, I forgot about that. You're right. In it, so it basically, once the bug gets into it, it kind of knocks them out. It kind of helps them go to sleep so they can't try to get out. Then they drown in the fluid, and then they eat them. But the bug stays in there. So if you're moving these plants around, and, and you're not paying attention, oh. and you happen to spill the fluid that's inside here, don't do it. It stinks. Don't it's do it. Not good. Don't so, do it. It's very, 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 very bad. So it, uh, I actually, you said something that made me think of something else, like we're dropping flies in there. In nature, there's no one coming around dropping the flies in, right? So they can't chase down their prey. What gets the prey to them in the first place? How do they attract their victims? Well, they use the same mechanisms that flowers do nectar, scent, and color. Now, bugs see in colors we don't, right? So they look different to the bugs than they look to us, but you'll notice red. Most carnivorous plants have some red somewhere or pink or something else you would find in a plant. Nectar, now remember I, you know, I had that little squirrel moment. There's nectar, there's actually visible nectar on this pitcher plant, it's oozing. From it produces the nectar up in the top in the glands because that's where it wants it to go. But it's producing so much that it's actually oozing down the pitcher. And you guys, it's you're welcome to come up and see it uh, af after we conclude. Um, but so those are the two main attractants: color and scent. And so the bugs come in; they're attracted by the color initially. They get a little closer, trying to investigate. They go, "Ooh, well, that smells nice," and then they move in on whatever it is that they're going to eat. Now. Some plants attract bugs by smelling sweet. And some plants attract bugs by smelling awful. And Saracenia have species that do both. Some of them you can smell, like not all of them, but right. some Saracenia actually smell sweet when you smell the pitcher. And some of them, if you smell the pitcher, you're going to be very upset that you tried that. So, uh, you know, if you're looking for something that's not going to stink, make sure you get the right kind. Uh, and the flowers for Saracenia give off a different aroma than the pitchers. They are not a flower that you're going to put your face in. They smell terrible. I brought a Saracenia flower into my kitchen from the greenhouse because it was beautiful. I wanted to put it out on the counter and enjoy it for the couple of days before you know all the snow melted, whatever. This was a couple of years ago. I had like four beautiful flowers on it in the greenhouse. I was all excited. Put it on the kitchen table. Next day I came down. I'm like, what stinks in here? Took me a little while to figure out. I brought the stink in with the plant. It was the, the flowers. They're attracting pollinators that are different from the ones they're trying to eat. Do we have any uh, online questions? Okay. One more thing that I wanted to say about these plants. And you'll notice in the photos, because we're just about out of time now, but why does the Saracenia plant's flowers taller than the plant themselves? It gives a chance for the pollinators to pollinate the plant before they go for their food and get eaten. So that is why the flower is usually taller than the plant itself. That way it doesn't eat the pollinators. They also tend to bloom earlier than they put up. Yeah, uh, of, earlier than they put up a lot of pitchers. Pitchers catch up, but uh, but yeah, they want to get some people in there. I think it's going to be our last one, but yes. South, south, south. The, the question is, where would you put them for location? Uh, should we put them east facing? These guys are sun gods. They like to tan. They're out there with a thing like this. Give me the rays. Uh, think of think of a tomato plant. As much, if you could grow it on the sun, grow it on the sun. So I think that's going to be our close for today. I thank you all for coming. Um, after we close down here, if anybody wants to stay, look at some books, look at some plants a little bit closer, 
ask some more questions. We'll be more than happy to hang around for a few minutes and do that. But I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, happy growing. Happy growing, guys.